from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. On the brief today, Kevin Cirilli from Capitol Hill on impeachment, Edward Evans from London with the hard Brexit back on the table, apparently, and David Baker from San Francisco on PG&E versus the California governor. Thanks. Now, Kevin, so really, let's start with you, Kevin. Yep. Impeachment, we're going to be to figure out the rules today and a vote tomorrow. Well, as we talk, the House Rules Committee is underway, and they're navigating the rules for the impeachment proceeding, the vote which is anticipated for tomorrow. Some of the key questions that members of the Rules Committee are grappling with are whether or not there will be a voice vote or an electronic vote. Now, just within the last half hour, new developments from the Senate. Remember, they're going to vote whether or not to convict. All indications signal that the Republican-controlled Senate will likely not vote to convict President Trump of that. But Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell responding to that letter. Remember, on Sunday, Minority Leader Chuck Schumer asked Leader McConnell for there to be additional witnesses called in the Senate trial. John Bolton, Mick Mulvaney. Well, Leader McConnell has just responded and said that that is not going to happen. Clearly, Democrats not going to like that response. Meanwhile, we're also getting new word from Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi about who will lead the prosecution process from the House of Representatives in the Senate trial. Once the House votes to likely impeach President Trump, there will be a handful of impeachment officials from the House who will then tr make their case in the Senate. Now, Speaker Pelosi said that that won't come until the next day or so, but behind closed doors, all indications are pointing toward House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff and House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler, two familiar faces with this entire process. Yes, David. Okay, thank you so much to Kevin Sorrell, our Chief Washington Correspondent. A lot yet to come up on Capitol Hill. Now we turn to Edward Evans. He's over in London. So we heard that, in fact, uh, the Prime Minister Johnson really wants a Brexit no matter what next year. Yes, in fact, so much so he's changed the law. He, wa he wants to change the law so that the transition period that will apply after January 31st cannot be extended beyond the end of December. If Britain and the EU cannot agree a trade deal by then, then Britain would crash out effectively and tra go and trade on World Trade Organization rules. Now, faced with the prospect of what would look awfully like a hard or rather no Brexit deal Brexit, uh, the pound has erased it, all the gains it's made since the general election, and UK focus stocks have fallen about 1% today. That, this, that Boris Johnson is doing this shouldn't be entirely surprising. Uh, he promised, he in fact ruled out ex extending the transition period in his party's manifesto. Uh, the thinking behind this may be that he wants to set a deadline to force some minds in Brussels, to focus minds in Brussels to reach a trade deal. Well, you put your finger on it, Edward. How, uh, can we tell, do we have any sense how much of this is posturing on the Prime Minister's part and real? Because we remember he said he'd rather be dead in a ditch than extend the last deadline, and then he went and had, extended it. Yeah, this is very much a political signal. Remember, he has just won an 80-seat majority in part by promising to get Brexit done. Uh, and this is a very, very large signal to those voters that he's deadly serious about taking Britain out of the EU without further delay. Importantly, though, this isn't. This is still reversible. He can just as easily make re, repeal this law or change it at a later date, should he want to do so. Uh, this is, as you rightly say, he's the same man who promised never to yeah. delay Brexit. He would rather die in that ditch, but that's exactly what he did. He delayed. Yeah, one of the basic principles I learned early on was that Parliament cannot bind itself, so it could always change the law, no matter what law, what law it passes. Indeed. Many thanks to Bloomberg. Brexit editor. He's Edward Evans over in London. And now we go to David Baker. He's out in San Francisco. So further developments in this drama of the PG&E bankruptcy. Tell us what's happened, David. So PG&E yesterday reached an agreement with the lawyers representing a bunch of the wildfire victims over the last uh, couple of years that essentially allows the two of those two parties to cut Governor Newsom out of the process of coming up with a, a settlement between them and packaging that in a larger restructuring to get the company out of bankruptcy. They had had an agreement in their uh, provision of their agreement that Newsom had to sign off on whatever they came up with. And last Friday, the governor made it very clear that he did not like the agreement and the restructuring plan that the company was pushing. He said it didn't meet the, his standards or state law. Well, th that's what I want to focus on, David, because, okay, the agreement might have said we have to have Gavin Newsom to sign off, but there is state law, and if he's right that it violates state law, it doesn't matter what the agreement says. They're not going to be able to go forward with it. Yeah, and 
in addition to that, I mean, he, while he's being removed from this step of the process, you can't actually remove the government governor from this process entirely. He appoints the state regulators who, in the end, are going to have to sign off on any reorganization plan to get the company out of bankruptcy. And yes, they will be looking at whether or not that agreement does meet state law. So essentially what's going on here is the company and the lawyers representing those wildfire victims are buying themselves more time to talk with the governor's office, talk with other stakeholders, and fine-tune the proposal that they've got, hoping that they can come up with something that everyone can agree on. You know, what, what a bankruptcy drama you have out there in San Francisco. Many thanks to David yeah. Baker. He is reporting from San Francisco. And now it's time for we check of the markets and how they are reacting to today's top stories. And of course, here is Abigail Doolittle. So a little reaction, not a lot, looks like. You're right about that. Very small moves. Although right now, just in the last couple of minutes, another all-time high for the S&P 500 mm -hmm. on that tiny up move. So the bulls are still trying to take charge. We're seeing that in other asset classes, too. Oil up once again, up for a fourth day. Emerging market stocks are also higher. That's the further end of the risk continuum. So it tells you there is a risk on mood confirmed by the fact that bonds, which earlier had been rallying, now down. So all of this probably a digestion of uh, the trade agreement that was reached and stocks being up so well, much this year. Exactly, because we did have it soar up on the news last Friday that we had a USMCA, we had to have a China deal, things like that. At least the markets aren't uh, rejecting that now. There's some concern that after they digest a little bit, they'll, they'll say that it's not so good. Apparently, they're okay with it. You're right about that. It's definitely not a sell the news type of event. On Friday, very muted response. Yesterday, a big rally. Uh, but the real rally is on the year. And that probably has more to do with the Fed, David, because this year, the S&P 500 up more than 25%. The tech sector up more than 40% chips up about 60 percent, the best year since 2009. If you recall, back in early January, Fed Chair Jerome Powell going somewhat dovish, and that's just given this market the tailwind. The trade deal is almost the frosting on the cake. Well, Andy, if it is the Fed, that would indicate, at least to me, that they're okay with what the Fed already did with three cuts this year. Mm -hmm. It's not so much what's coming next, because the Fed is not indicating a lot more cuts in 2020. And it seems markets are probably happy with that, yeah. the fact that we do have stocks sort of in cruise control, this melt up. You know, we have interest rates uh, super low. That seems to be helping out the economy. We have haven't had uh, any sort of dramatic slowdown. That had been the fear. Lots of hopes that the earnings recession that we had been in about to end when the reporting period ends and starts in January. That's what we'll be talking about yeah. day by day no in kidding. January, those earnings. Earnings do matter in the yes, end. Yes, they okay. do. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much to Abigail Doolittle for that market check. And now we're going to go to Mark Crumpton. He's here with Bloomberg First Word News. Mark. David, as our Kevin Cirilli told us moments ago, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is criticizing Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer's proposal about who should test during a likely impeachment trial against President Trump. Schumer wants the Senate to agree to hear testimony from acting chief of staff Mick Mulvaney, former National Security Advisor John Bolton, and two other White House officials. McConnell says that would conflict with the procedure used during President Clinton's trial in 1999, when the Senate heard opening arguments and a motion to dismiss the charges before deciding whether to hear witnesses. Pakistan's former president's been sentenced to death for high treason. A special court in Islamabad convicted Pervez Musharraf today of violating the Constitution by unlawfully declaring emergency rule when he was in power. The 76-year-old has lived in self-imposed exile in Dubai for more than three years. He seized power in a military coup in 1999 and ruled Pakistan until 2008. Musharraf's attorneys say he will appeal. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson won't attend the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland next month and is banning his ministers from going as well. It's a message from Johnson that his government will remain focused on Brexit. Prime Minister says he wants to, quoting here, get on with delivering the priorities of the British people. Today, Johnson criticized, or rather hosted, the first meeting of his cabinet since last week's election. Meantime, Trump administration officials say the president plans on attending Davos. At least three people are dead, more than a dozen injured after suspected tornadoes ripped through the deep south late Monday. The storm smashed into buildings, down trees, and left a trail of destruction in Louisiana and Alabama. Forecasters say more severe weather could be on the way. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries.
I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. Coming up, the WTO frozen, USMCA still in play, and phase one of a China deal promised within the next two weeks. We talk with Rufus Yerksey. He's president of the National Foreign Trade Council. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. As much as I don't like the appellate body going out of existence, it's something that has to be done to get other countries to wake up that if you want the WTO process, and I do like the WTO process, uh, it's got to be reformed. That was Senator Chuck Grassley, Senate Finance Committee Chairman, talking about the U.S. decision to block appointments to the WTO appeals panel. Welcome now someone who served as the Deputy Director General of the WTO, as well as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative. Rufus Yerksa is now President of the For National Foreign Trade Council. He comes to us today from Washington. So, Rufus, welcome. You know this body terribly well. Explain to us what the dispute is about, because as far as I can tell, it's not entirely partisan. We have Ron Wyden, for example, agreeing with Chuck Grassley. There are problems with this process. I think that everybody concedes there are problems. On the other hand, everybody also says that we want the WTO to work effectively. There are a lot of um, disputes we've had in the past where the U.S. has won cases. And so, you know, as an offensive tool, we like it. Uh, we just want to see some uh, improvements in the dispute settlement process. The administration has taken a very hard line on this and got a lot of countries upset. I think from business point of view, we want both sides, both our administration and the other sides, to talk about what are the kinds of fixes we could make in the appellate body process that would unstick this and, and get it back on track. As far as you know, Rufus, are there discussions going on between the WTO and the administration to try to come to some compromise agreement? Well, I, I'm not... I don't know the details of what they're talking about. I know the director general of the WTO has actually uh, announced that he's looking for uh, new ideas for solutions. In fact, we just uh, commissioned a paper by a former U.S. dispute settlement lawyer with some proposals for how to uh, overcome these differences between the administration and other parties in Geneva. So I think there are discussions going on. Uh, we'll have to see how Ambassador Lighthizer and USTR reacts to those. Okay, so that's multilateral, obviously, WTO, where you served. But let's go to sort of bilateral, U.S.-China. Uh, we now are told that maybe within the next two weeks we may have a so-called phase one agreement. Still a little unclear what's going to be in that agreement. What do you understand about what we should expect? Oh, yeah, it's really very unclear. I mean, obviously, Ambassador Lighthizer is saying this phase one deal is a big deal and that it has a lot of substance to it. He's mentioned 86 pages of text, but nobody's seen any of that. What we do know is that they're, they're saying that there are uh, specific commitments from the Chinese on increasing uh, both agricultural and industrial goods exports, but it isn't quite clear yet what are the other elements of the deal. Ambassador Lighthizer mentioned some things the Chinese are committing to on intellectual property and forced technology transfer. But look, the, the details of this are still very unclear. And the other thing that's unclear is, is how much is this actually going to impact the bottom line? Are the Chinese actually going to deliver on some of these commitments? And the other problem is, you know, a huge number of the tariffs are still staying in place. Yes, they're getting rid of the uh, uh, tariffs that were going to go in effect on December 15th, and they're cutting in half some of the more recent tariff increases. We still have about $250 billion of, of uh, imports from China that are at 25 percent. A lot of those are manufactured input products that affect U.S. manufacturing. We're talking with Rufus Yerksa. He's the president of the National Foreign Trade Council, coming to us from Washington. So, Rufus, on those two issues about enforcement and the tariffs, which are linked one to the other, evidently the administration basically is saying, we're going to keep a lot of these tariffs in place until you really perform on these things. Is that a sensible approach? Has that been tried before with China? I'm not sure if it's been tried before exactly this way, but obviously what, what Trump is trying to do is achieve something that he can take political credit for as a deal, uh, but that the Chinese can actually agree to. And, you know, it's, it's not really clear yet whether he got a lot of substance in this phase one or whether some of this is uh, more in the nature of kind of 
you know, window dressing on the deal so that it looks good for him politically in, in 2020. And I, I think we really won't know how much. I mean, it, Bob Lighthizer, I saw him this weekend on the news saying this is, you know, the greatest agreement ever. We're really going to have to see how much he actually delivers. But politically, it's probably good for him for the time being. Longer term, it's not clear how much this uh, uh, improves. You know, they, they have to go on to the next phases right. of the negotiations with China to, to get a really good deal. Rufus, before we get to the next phase, what about this phase? You've been involved in these sorts of negotiations. Why is it so difficult to get the text out? I mean, I heard from the administration, no, you have to translate it all. Well, presumably these are texts they've been working on for some time. They must have been working on translations. Is this unusual to take this long to translate 86 pages? Well, I'm not really clear why there aren't even any draft texts out there or, or summaries of the texts that aren't in legal language. It seems to me it raises issues about whether they really do have a meeting of the minds on all the provisions. But Ambassador Lighthizer said it's a done deal. So, you know, I'm not really sure, David, to tell you the truth. Is this totally done or are there still, uh, you know, some fundamental things that they haven't totally agreed on? We're going to have to see in January. Yeah, this is Rufus Jerksa. He's the president of the National Foreign Trade Council. Let's turn to another deal we thought was done. We saw Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, come out to camera and say, we have an agreement on USMCA that's successor to NAFTA. And now we wake up today to say, you know, Mexico's got some problems with these trade attaches going to be attached to the embassy. What is that about? Well, you know, Mexico is claiming that they didn't, uh, they didn't know that the implementing legislation was going to include these trade attaches, that they had an understanding about how these inspections in Mexico would occur and they wouldn't be through that mechanism. Ambassador Lighthizer sent a, a letter back saying these trade attaches are not the inspectors. Uh, and so, you know, it looks to us as if that issue is probably not going to scupper the whole deal. I, I expect the House to pass it uh, this week and then it'll go over to the Senate passed next year. The Mexican Congress has already approved it. Uh, so, you know, I don't think this latest uh, dispute necessarily un unhinges uh, the deal. I mean, it looks to me right now like we're probably going to get this USMCA put in place uh, early next year. Okay. Many thanks, Rufus. Really great to have you with us as always. That's Rufus Yerksa. He's the president of the National Foreign Trade Council. Still ahead, Boeing is in the crosshairs again today on news that it's stopping production of its 737 MAX. It's our stock of the hour. That's next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for the stock of the hour. Boeing is higher by about 1% today, even after the company said it will temporarily halt production of the 737 MAX. Kelly Lines is here with more. So you surprised me. I <laughs> thought it was down. It's actually up. What's going on? Well, I think a lot of the downside surprise was yesterday when it was first reported the board was weighing this. The stock fell about 4%. So I think a lot of that was priced in. Uh, and so we just got confirmation of that today that sometime in January they're going to stop production of this plane. And of course, that's really just because the timeline for it coming back in the air is really uncertain. We had the FAA saying yesterday, we are not, or yesterday, excuse me, last week, we are in no rush. Uh, some analysts thinking it won't actually come until the end of January or even beyond. And the, it's been a serious cash strain for Boeing. They continue yeah. to produce this plane throughout its entire grounding. They've been making about 42 a day. They have about 400 uh, that are in storage right now, but they're not actually getting paid for those planes until they're delivered. So they've been spending all this cash. One analyst over at Jefferies says that for every quarter this plane has been grounded, they've burned about $4.4 billion. Now that they are going to halt production, it's going to be about half that burn. But that's kind of the move Boeing has to make here. You may be seeing the stock getting a little bit of a bid today because it's like, okay, the company is going to save a bit of cash. One of the things we think about is employment. What happens to all those workers? So the company is saying that no one at this point is going to get laid off or furloughed. They're either going to continue working 
working on the 737 program or they're going to be put elsewhere. Now, if this extends for, you know, we're again unclear how long this is going to go on at some point, maybe that could change. But for right now, those workers are staying at Boeing. That's Boeing workers. Right. There are people who supply parts to Boeing. A uh, lot. It might be a little harder for them. Yeah, I mean, Boeing has 600 suppliers in its supply wow. chain. And you look at a company like Spirit Aerosystems, about half its revenue comes from the 737. So that could be a serious uh, top line concern for a lot of these suppliers. You're seeing a lot of them fall today. And then again, as long as long as this could extend, they could eventually see job cuts. And that could actually ripple back and affect Boeing because should we see job cuts of some of those suppliers when they are again ready to start producing that plane, that could create delays because this is a very tightly choreographed operation. And that's just on the supply side. This is not even considering the broader macroeconomic effects that Boeing and its halting production could have. Well, that's what you have to worry about. GDP right. growth, you have to worry about uh, uh, jobs numbers that start coming out next month right. and the month after where it really affects those. Yeah, our, actually one analyst uh, researcher we have here at Bloomberg Economics said that at the most it could knock a full percentage point off of first quarter GDP. Now economists don't seem to think that it's going to impact full year growth, but you could really start seeing this show up in some other economic data. It's a big manufacturer. It's a big exporter. We've already seen it show up in trade data, the fact that mm -hmm. Boeing hasn't been exporting these planes throughout the grounding. And so it is a real economic concern. Okay, finally, to throw you a curveball, let's go from planes to cars. Oh, PSA boy. Group. <laughs> Redhead, just crossing now. PSA Group is said to approve merger plan with Fiat. So this is Peugeot and Fiat getting together. We knew they were working on that. Right. A major merger in the auto industry, I mean, which I'm sure could be potentially good for those two companies. At the same time, it reflects the stress that the entire auto industry right. globally is suffering under. This is what you have to do to operate. Now, I believe this company, if these two do indeed combine, are going to pass GM in terms of global yep. sales. So they are going to get a certain amount of scale here. But again, to your point, this speaks to what exactly you have to do as an automaker in this slowing environment in order to survive. Soft demand, you have to go to electric and you have to go to autonomous all at the same takes time. That's a lot of That's money. really <laughs> tricky. Okay, many thanks to Bloomberg's Kaylee Alliance for joining us today. Up next, President Erdogan says Turkey is not walking away from NATO, but a Russian missile purchase is putting the future of this alliance in jeopardy. We discuss with the senior member of the Foreign Relations Committee, he's Senator Ben Cardin. That's next on Balance of Power. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, it's one of the most important decisions House Democrats will make in the impeachment process. That is, who will prosecute the president in next year's Senate trial? Bloomberg's learned that House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff and Judiciary Chairman Gerald Nadler are expected to be named to the trial manager's team. The announcement is likely to happen tomorrow. That's when the House votes on the articles of impeachment. A former top Trump campaign aide who became a star witness for special counsel Robert Mueller is headed to prison. Rick Gates was sentenced today to 45 days behind bars. Gates' testimony helped convict Trump confidant Roger Stone and send former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort to prison. At Gates' sentencing in Washington today, the judge praised his work for the government but imposed the jail time for tax and lobbying crimes. In France, teachers, doctors, Eiffel Tower employees, and workers across the country's labor force walked off the job today to join the nearly two-week-old strike against proposed pension reforms. They opposed President Emmanuel Macron's overhaul of France's pension system, which would raise the retirement age and end special privileges for some workers. The government says it's sticking with its plans. The United Nations is urging governments, businesses, and others to reboot the world's response to refugees. The first global refugee forum opened in Geneva today. The UN's High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, told the audience, quote, our world is in turmoil and 25 million refugees are looking to us for solutions, end quote. The number of people fleeing their homes is on the rise, along with hostility toward migrants. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Mark. 
U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper is questioning Turkey's commitment to NATO. This comes a day after President Erdogan of Turkey threatened to close two of the military alliance's bases in retaliation for potential U.S. sanctions over Turkey's purchase of a Russian missile system. Welcome now a senior member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He is Senator Ben Cardin, Democrat of Maryland, and he comes to us today from Capitol Hill. So, Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Take us and give us your perspective on what's going on here. It seems that things are getting worse, not better, in relations between the United States and Turkey. Well, David, first, it's good to be with you, but you're exactly right. We are concerned about Turkey's actions in regards to our national security and the future of NATO. They've done certain things that have to go, we cannot go unchallenged. The purchase of the S-400 missile defense system from Russia compromises the NATO alliance as far as technology is concerned and shared technology. Their Turkey's in incursion into Syria affecting the Kurdish fighters, which are our best ground forces in stopping the advancements uh, of the Assad regime. That also uh, compromises our national security. So we have to act. We have to let Turkey know that that type of action compromises our regional security and our national security. We want to maintain that strategic partnership with Turkey. We want Turkey to stay in NATO, but it has to be with basic understanding. Senator Cardin, uh, what would be the effect on U.S. national security if, in fact, they did go ahead and close these two bases, one of which, as I understand, is Inserlik, which I've heard about for many years, going to the Kennedy administration, also a radar array over there. What would that do if, in fact, they proceed with that and shut those bases down? Well, clearly, uh, Turkey has a strategic location in regards to our regional security with their border countries of major concern to us. So it's important for NATO to maintain the partnership with Turkey. But let me make it clear. Our national security uh, is compromised by what Turkey has done. We don't want NATO's technology compromised by Turkey's relationship with Russia. So as important as that partnership is, it's more important that we maintain our basic commitment in NATO to a mutual defense, and Turkey's actions does compromise that. Senator, let's turn now to trade, particularly trade between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Last week, we heard from Speaker of the House Pelosi, who said Democrats and Republicans had come to terms and that we would be moving forward, although it appears after an impeachment trial, if there is such a thing, in January. Then today, we heard Mexico has some concerns with these so-called trade attaches. Is that just a blip, or is there a serious issue here? I hope it's just a blip, because quite frankly, I, I applaud uh, the work of Speaker Pelosi and U.S. T Trade Representative Lighthizer in reaching an agreement between Canada and Mexico that is really historic in regards to labor protections, environmental protections, and it takes uh, the agreement, the trade agreement, to the next level. Uh, my understanding is that from uh, Ambassador Lighthizer that this blip has been taken care of and that we'll be able to move forward in, with a vote in the House this week on ratification and we should have a vote in the Senate in early January. Uh, we're speaking with Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. Uh, talking about the USMCA, that successor uh, agreement to NAFTA, give us a sense of what that will do to the United States, its economy, its farmers, its manufacturing. Well, make no mistake about it, uh, Mexico, Canada are two major trading partners. It's critically important to our economy. We, uh, that business, both import-export, helped create many and sustain many jobs here in the United States. The problem with NAFTA is that it had chapters dealing with environment and labor that were outside the core agreement and were not enforceable. That's been corrected by this USMCA agreement. We'll have enforceable provisions in regards to both labor and environment, and we will also have a way to trigger that enforcement with time limits so that they're effectively enforced. That we didn't have in NAFTA, that will help, we think, all three of the economies, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, continue to grow. Senator, as I mentioned, it appears at least the ultimate ratification of USMCA on the Senate side will wait until after a trial, if there is a trial, on these two impeachment articles that are coming up. We had an exchange just today from the majority leader, Mitch McConnell, with uh, Senator Schumer of New York, where he said basically, we don't need to call witnesses, we can just go ahead and vote on this thing. As I understand it, a majority of senators could decide to call witnesses. It doesn't have to be the two-thirds, just a majority. Is there any realistic process, that, prospect that in fact that will happen? 
Well, I certainly hope so. I hope we do have a mutually agreed process. Uh, I find it outrageous that Leader McConnell is consulting only with the White House in deciding who, what witnesses should be called. He will take an oath, as every member of the Senate will take an oath, to be an impartial juror in the, the presentations by the House. How can you be impartial if you make decisions solely with the White House on what witnesses to call? You need to get the House managers involved and certainly the Democratic leader involved on a fair process. That's critically important that that be done. So I am concerned. I think Senator Schumer's request to hear from the witnesses that have the direct knowledge of what the president was doing in his conversations with Ukraine and dealing with the holding up of, uh, of funds and dealing with the White House visit, I think that is critically important that we can hear directly from those witnesses. They're the, they're the closest to the source. We're talking with Senator Ben Cardin, Democrat of Maryland. Uh, on the question of impeachment, it's not just the Capitol Hill that's divided. There was a poll out just from Washington Post yeah. and ABC News over the weekend that said basically it seems like the country's divided right down the middle. The overwhelming majority of Democrats think we should go ahead with impeachment. The overwhelming majority of Republicans think the reverse. And the independents seem to be split right down the middle. Is it appropriate to proceed with impeachment if the country is that much on the fence? Quite frankly, David, I don't think we have any choice. This is a constitutional responsibility that members of the Congress have. They have to carry out that constitutional responsibility. The politics of it cannot be the driving force. We need to recognize that we are the only, the impeachment process is the only way to hold a president accountable for these types of actions. Now, we'll judge the facts as they come in at trial. We'll make our own judgments as to whether they're impeachable offenses or not. But we can't be judged by the popularity of this. This is a, really a, a fundamental constitutional responsibility that we have to carry out. Uh, finally, Senator, uh, we have an, a blockbuster, if I can put it that way, spending bill coming our way here that has to be acted upon this week if the government doesn't shut down. I, I, I don't know. Maybe you've read all 1,400 pages. I wouldn't expect you necessarily have done that. But what is most important to you in that appropriations bill? I think the fact that we have a bipartisan budget agreement that will go throughout the rest of this year, that we don't have continuing resolutions or government shutdowns, that it reflects the priorities of the members of both the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, I think that's good news for our nation. I think we will not be on autopilot. We'll, we will make decisions. Do I agree with all those decisions? No. Am I, will I have disappointments? Absolutely. But I am very pleased that we'll have a budget that reflects the will of Congress that will pass this year if we can get this done. Okay, Senator, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. That's Senator Ben Cardin. He's Democrat of Maryland and a member of the Foreign Relations Committee. Coming up, how much would a phase one China de trade deal really help America's farmers? We'll ask U.S. Agricultural Department trade advisor Tom Kehoe. That's next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. America's farmers have been suffering, and trade issues have not made their situation any easier. But help may be on the way. Welcome now Tom Kehoe. He is trade advisor to the United States Department of Agriculture. Tom, welcome. Good to Thank have you. you here. Nice to be here. So let's start with China, because there's been a big issue, soybeans and other agricultural products. And they've really, the farmers have been hurting. There have been some subsidies from the government mm -hmm. to help them through. Uh, where subsidies are, from the tariffs. Oh, from the tariffs, fair enough. If we can get into a discussion of who's paying those tariffs, but let's put that yeah, okay. aside for one se yeah, second. Be... What, do we, what do we think we're going to get out of this deal, phase one? <clears throat> well, they're using the 2017 China purchase, ag purchases, as, as a baseline, which was $24 billion. So that's going to be the baseline for 2020 and 2021. They're promising to buy another $32 billion on top of that, 16 and 16, which r brings both years' purchases to 40 and $40 billion. That's 80. And they said, and they may even come in for another $5 billion in each year. So there's, there's enormous purchases. Enormous. It's so enormous that some people are saying, I'm not sure it can be done, that it's even possible to do. How are we going to get there? And well, how much of it, for example, the reports today, ethanol may be a significant component of that. Well, I was asked that, okay. And, and, uh, and I'm not allowed to tell you or anybody else until the USTR releases the details what are the products that are in it because it may drive the markets. You know, and I'm not the only egg advisor. There's quite a few of us. So if we all got on all the different networks, we'd have quite a mess. 
But there's no surprises in this. Let's put it that way. I mean, it's all the products that have always, we've done business with them. You know, somebody just didn't invent a new item to send to China and it's not going to drive the markets. It's all the items that we've always sent there, but in big numbers. And look, somebody just broke the, uh, the marathon record. I mean, it was, it was kind of an aided. He had, he had rabbits running with him, but he broke, broke the world record by a lot. It's better to have a goal, both sides moving towards a goal. If we don't hit it, we're not going to miss it by much. But, and this is both sides are committing to do this in, in writing. This is part of the deal. It's not just a verbal like you and I talking about it. We're talking with Tom Keogh. He's a trade advisor with the United States Department of Agriculture. So uh, we haven't seen the text yet. Mm -hmm. uh, 86 pages, we're told it is. And 29 of them are ag. Uh, 29 are ag. Well, that's interesting. What's the delay? Why, why, why does it take the, that long? There's no delay. Uh, look, you know, much like with the financial news when you folks put it out, it's got to be right because a lot of people are relying on it. So they're scrubbing, quote unquote, the language that both sides will agree to, you know, the period should be here and the parenthesis should be here, et cetera, et cetera. They've agreed to all the details. So they're just polishing it up so that the Bloomberg news services of the world literally can take it and run with it. The markets will run with it. So it's a big, you know, it's very important. The fact that I'm here today talking to you you know, it's, it's an important deal, and we're all waiting for it with bated breath. It so means it's real. It means it's, it's very real. Exactly real. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, once again, we're talking with Tom Key, who is a trade advisor to the United States Department of Agriculture. One of the reports in the Bloomberg today, and this would not be in the agreement, I don't think, uh, is that one of the ways China will get to those big numbers is actually by having some direct imports into the mainland that had been going through Hong Kong. Uh, I heard that today, and um, I can't confirm or deny that, okay? But... Let's just say it's true, and I don't know whether it is or it isn't. I don't think Hong Kong's ag imports are significant compared to the land mass of China, and the, mul the bulk of the population is on the land mass. Mm -hmm. So I can't confirm or deny that. I'm not going to say one way or the other because it's, I was on a, two lengthy calls yesterday with the USTR's office on USMCA and China. We, they went into exhausting details. That was not one of them, but I couldn't confirm it you know, or deny it, so I don't know. So, so this is for two years, as I understand. That's, two that's years. what we've been talking about is for two Correct. years. Is it the plan, the hope, the expectation that this, this will change supply chains in a longer term and this will continue out past that, or is this a two-year and you're out? Well, uh, I, I think they are already said, Lighthouse's office, the, you know, and he's a, called Ambassador Lighthouse, they've right. already said that they're already starting to work on phase two. So, look, they need us and we need them. Yeah. Maybe for different reasons, but we need one another. So I think they're going to figure out how to make it work. It's in our interest, the, 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 the residents, the citizens of both countries, it's in our mutual best interest to figure out how to live together and, you know, and stop you know, trying to beat the heck out of one another. And like you and I chatted briefly before the, we went on live, you know, civility and discourse, you can get a lot of stuff done if you're willing to talk to the other guy, even if you don't agree with him. You know, you don't have to agree with Mike Bloomberg, but, you know, respectfully, you have to listen to him. He's got some valid points. He's got some great ideas. So, I mean, I think that's we in America, and I can't speak for China, we've drifted away from that. I'd love to see some of that taught in the schools again, you know, around the country, mm -hmm. civility, discourse, mm -hmm. politeness, manners, grooming. It goes a long way when you have to sit opposite a guy you really don't like him, <laughs> but you have to do business with them, and you have to figure out how to make it work. And that's life, isn't but, it? But our leaders have to set examples for us in that Absolutely. regard. Absolutely. And leaders, I'm not talking about even one side of the aisle, both sides of the aisle. Both There's a lot of the discussion aisle. today in the political realm that we would have been shocked at oh. 15, 20, 25 Absolutely. years ago. Absolutely, in the language. So we need our leaders, including the President of the United States, to show, show us the I way. I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think that starts with you and with me. You know, we, we can ask other people, you know, would you change your behavior? But I think if everyone listening to the show, mm -hmm. if people that are concerned about it say, you know what, I'm going to change the way I act. I'm going to change the way I speak and the way I talk. And I'm going to clean up my act, so to speak, in a lot of ways. That's how it starts. I mean, that's, that's Christian behavior. That's what's yeah. taught, you know. It is indeed. Let me come back one moment on the tariffs, uh, mm -hmm. because you said those uh, subsidies of farmers came out of the tariffs. But ultimately, it's the American citizen who pays those, right, in the form of increased prices well, yes and tariffs. No. I mean, China's not writing a check to us. No, but China devalued their currency as soon as the tariffs went into place. See, they can cook the books, and this, mm -hmm. this is something I've talked about considerably. This summer, Mnuchin, Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin, and the president both said, we know China's a currency manipulator, mm -hmm. and the whole world went away. Oh, my God, and it drove the markets, and everyone was surprised, but the world has known that. This is no surprise. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the state-owned enterprises, you drive down one of the, you, right. you know, you don't have them in the United States. You drive down a street in Beijing or Shanghai, you see a hundred different banks. You've never yeah. heard of any yeah. of them. Yeah. They're not even European banks yeah. because the government controls most yeah. of them. So right. there's even some yep. thought that maybe they're cooking the books on a lot of the things, too. But we don't know that. We, we don't, indeed. Okay, many thanks to Tom Kehoe. It's really great to have you with us. Thank you. He's a trade representative, trade advisor for the United States Department of Agriculture. And we're going to have much more with Tom coming up in our second hour of Bloomberg Radio. And a quick disclaimer now. Michael Bloomberg, of course, is the founder and majority <laughs> owner of Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News. Coming up, Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan will be putting his stamp on the FOMC next year as a voting member. Our exclusive interview with him next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's been an up and down year for the Federal Reserve, cutting rates three times this year in the face of weakening global growth. And now the central bank is indicating it will hold pat, even though those underlying conditions have not really changed. Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan sat down with Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes for an exclusive interview, and she asked whether the Fed's shift back to neutral was about global growth, or is it really about the yield curve? If you roll back the clock to June, it wasn't just weak global growth. It was weak manufacturing in the United States, weaker than it's been since 2009, and weak business in fixed investment. And I said at the time we should do modest, limited, restrained adjustment to the Fed funds rate to address those issues. But the other thing I was worried about, which you just talked about, was the curve was inverted. And I felt it would be much better if we had an upwardly sloping curve. So to me, the curve is a symptom that maybe our adjustments were about right. And, and it, it, it wasn't intended uh, to solve these issues, but it was intended to adjust policy in light of these issues. And I think the curve being upwardly sloping tells me we're probably in about the right place. So that curve is a strong signal if it were to move in the other direction again. It would again. concern me. Yes. So I want to move on to the consumer because the Fed is putting so much impact on the consumer. While investment has been weak, this keeps the economy in good place. But retail sales have been decelerating. Yeah. The November number was half what the consensus forecast was. Our Bloomberg economics team is expecting holiday sales to only come in at a gain of 3.4% yeah. over last year. That will be the second weakest of the cycle. What if your main engine of growth is starting to kind of run out of some gas? Well, I don't think that's going to happen. And, and here's what I'll be watching for. Um, I've been worried that weak business investment and weak manufacturing would seep into other parts of the economy. We haven't seen that yet. And so even if any given month or quarter consumer spending is a little weaker than it might have been, there's no doubt the consumer balance sheets are not perfect, but they're in much better shape. And we've got a very tight uh, jobs market. And there's no evidence I see that the jobs market is doing anything but getting tighter. That's a pretty good tailwind for the consumer. So unless something changes, that causes employment picture to change, the consumer is going to be solid for next year. That doesn't mean in any month or quarter they're going to spend, but I'm telling you they have the capacity to spend. And so I think that's a pretty good underpinning for the economy. The other side of the policy coin, as you get ready to cast those votes in 2020, uh, is inflation. Yeah. And at the press conference after the meeting last week, Jay Powell said he would have to see persistently rising inflation to get on board with a rate hike. Mm -hmm. What's your position? Um, we've, we've been in a situation where uh, we've been able to run a very tight labor force without, without inflation taken off. We've had muted inflation. Um, I, I, I probably would have a, this is what's great about the FOMC, we all have a little bit different take on this. Uh, I, I'll be looking at what potential growth does. I'll be looking at what the trends are in the labor market. And yes, in addition, I'll be looking at where we, where we versus our target. But I'll, look, I'll be looking at a range of factors. And I'll also be looking at financial stability issues in weighing whether some action is appropriate. And I'll be looking at that broad menu. That was Dallas Fred President Robert Kaplan speaking earlier with Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes. Coming up on Balance of Power, we continue on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to have more with Tom Keogh, an advisor to U.S. Department of Agriculture. Also joining us, Jessica Levinson of Loyola Law School. We're going to talk with her about impeachment. 
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.